Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things that happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Coffee. Without it, we would never have had the Industrial Revolution. We'd all be still living in Europe in mud huts. Here in Laredo, we have the Organic Man Coffee Trike. 4501 McPherson, the best coffee on the planet. If you can't get to Laredo, you can order from the Organic Man Coffee Trike dot shop. Welcome to Storytime with Chris James. I will pick up right where I left off, hopefully. We don't do missing person reports, but we do find a few cars without drivers that kind of fit into y'all's investigation. The trooper behind the counter was being as helpful as he could. Everyone was looking forward to ending this vanishing teen problem. Uh, tell Angie to give me a call if she needs anything else. He slid a pile of folders across the counter. Pam guessed they must have gone to school together or something. The idea of anyone wanting to date the older woman was just so gross. Hefting this new stack of paperwork up in her arms, Pam staggered out the door and over to her pickup. That's odd. The door was standing open on the passenger side as if to help her out with her load. Pam dropped the files onto the seat and then looked around to try to see who might have opened the door. On the drive back to the office, Pam wondered how she was going to get out from under the less-than-friendly watch of the card reader. Pulling into the parking lot, front garden, Pam parked next to a nice line of corn that looked just about ready for harvesting. The Civil War soldiers were doing a good job in making the old mansion look more like a farm. Hefting the load of DPS reports, Pam was curious as to how many abandoned vehicles there were. Knowing Madam Dingus, she probably asked for every port report in the state. It was a balancing act to get up the steps and through the door without dropping too many files. And, uh, Pam took a quick look to be sure the yard goat wasn't following her, devouring the borrowed files. As she was passing Hildy's desk and now sitting at the front desk, Hildy said, Madam Dingwhopper said to get busy sorting out any relevant information and she'd be back sometime tonight. Pam stopped her forward stagger long enough to ask, where did she go? The top ten files slid from the load and landed on the floor, papers sliding out everywhere. Uh, someone called and said something about knowing where all the missing dirt bags went. Uh, they wanted to speak to you, but that woman snatched the phone away from me and then ran out the door. Hildy hadn't bothered to look up from the magazine she was reading. Oh, uh, okay, I'll just, uh, Pam walked to her office to gently pitch the pile of files on top of the other piles of files. The mass was beginning to look like what they had found in Hans Hansenson's office. This explains why his office was such a mess. Pam shut the door to separate her from the unthinkable ordeal in her future. The sound of creaking floorboards came from under the door. The bag team met out in the classroom. The students were off for lunch. So what do we know about the missing kids? Pam didn't need to say missing bag members as well. Hortense is scanning all her mirrors, but what with all the precautions, she's not getting much. The scryer was trying to look for traces of her fellow scryer, but was hindered by the necessity of being tied to a chair that was cemented to the floor of her office, and the mirror was behind an iron mesh screen. 
Prince Wapo was assigned to keep an eye on her and alert the proper folks should anything go awry. Currently, the prince was deep in slumber on the table next to Hortense. The files that the ghost found have some good info, but we still need to track down each and every lead, Manuel said, not knowing Sharma and Dan were sitting right next to him. He had a feeling, but he couldn't tie it down. So far, it looks as if the missing kids are A, in the Bermuda Triangle, B, in some other dimension, or C, not so much missing as invisible. A discussion broke out as to how they could find or uninvisible the missing. As the group of ghosts began to show up at the door to the classroom, Pam had to call the meeting to an end. We'll keep looking under every rock until we find them, or we run out of rocks. She looked around at her fellow investigators and a few members who just wanted to help. Let's go see what we can see. They turned the room back over to, to Kalinda and went in search of ideas. With no ideas pounding on her head demanding attention, Pam guessed at the possible direction to try. Anything that would keep her away from the mess in her office. Pam drove over to the school and looked for Ralph or Mindy. She was dressed in her official investigator's outfit, which consisted of jeans and a t-shirt. Running shoes were far more practical than school loafers. Walking through the halls, none of the staff inquired as to her not being in class, since she wasn't dressed like a student. They all thought she might be a very young-looking substitute teacher. Pam asked in the front office, Has Ralph... Uh, I don't have his last name. Ralph, the guy who's probably been in trouble a few times. Or maybe Mindy. Mindy, the girl who's dressed like she went to a bad party. That girl who was in here... Pam ran out of words. Fortunately, both Mindy and Ralph were well known in the front office. Uh, kind of like Pam. No, neither of them has been in today. Well, that didn't help any. Pam was considering her next move as she walked out the front door of the school. Uh, that was how she spotted Mindy getting into a car right next to her pickup. She looked worse than ever. Her clothing was way past due for a good washing, and so was she. Are guys that weird they would go out with somebody that messed up looking? No answer was forthcoming. The car was pulling away as Pam, putting her running shoes to good use, ran for her truck and jumped behind the wheel. It fired right up and Pam was trying to hook the seat belt up as she pulled the truck into first, trying to follow Mindy, who was already several blocks away. Why is it when you're in a gigantic hurry, no one else is in a rush? The other cars were all just plodding along as if the world wasn't about to end. Of course, Pam had no indication the world was in any kind of major trouble, uh, but it just felt like an earth-ending kind of situation. A signal light turned yellow, and the car in front of Pam slammed on their brakes. Pam had to use all her vast skills developed over an entire year of maneuvering a vehicle without killing anyone to avoid hitting the stopped car. Once her pickup had come to a complete stop, Pam opened one eye to see if she was in trouble. No, nope, no police report, no accident forms to file, no body shop bills coming her way, at least not this time. The light turned green and traffic began to flow, but now the car carrying her nemesis was nowhere to be seen. With no clue as to where the girl had gone, Pam tried to look down each side street as she drove through the intersections. It wasn't so much her abilities as just plain good fortune that she managed to not plow into anyone. As her vehicle was just clearing an intersection, Pam spotted what she hoped was the car carrying Mindy at the far end of the street. It was too late to try making the corner, so she hit the gas, well, she sped up a bit, and made the next corner to the right. 
She drove as fast as she was able through what looked like a residential neighborhood until she came to the next street that would take her right once more. They never show any of this in the movies, Pam told nobody in particular. As the block took her to the street, she hoped what had the car that she hoped has hauling Mindy away, a Pam took a left and scanned the cars ahead for the right one. Uh, there it was, maybe, or could it be that one? I should have taken down the license number. Pam felt as if maybe she should see about taking some private investigation classes. I wonder if I can take some online investigator classes. Maybe I can get my license. Now, Pam glanced to the right as she went by a gas station. Oh, shoot. Well, there was Mindy walking inside. The car she was riding in was stopped at the gas pumps. Pam found an inconspicuous place to park and then got busy watching the car. Pulling a pencil from her bag, she tried to jot down the license number. Let's see. It's a backwards K followed by an 8 and, or is that a B? Pam turned around in her seat and looked back at the suspect's car. Suspect's car? Now she was using cool investigator lingo. Oops, not a backwards anything. Now the license plate was readable. As she jotted down the number and letters along with a brief two-page description of the car. When at long last Mindy came sauntering out from the store, she was carrying a bag. It looked as if she had scored some beer. Pam wondered how a teenager was able to violate so many laws without getting caught. It must have something to do with all the desperate disappearances. Pam got ready to follow the suspect's car as they went by. And maybe she has become gifted in hypnotism. Pam got busy following the vehicle. In the vehicle ahead, Mindy pulled a can of soda from the bag and chugged it down, followed by a second and then a third. The driver looked at her. Wow, you must be thirsty. Uh, too bad you couldn't get us some beer. Mindy just wiped her mouth on the sleeve of her far from clean shirt and opened number four. As the car, being followed by the pickup, being driven by Pam, came to the edge of town, traffic cleared out enough that it was quite obvious Pam was following the car. And never having done anything even remotely like this, Pam was following just a few car lengths behind Mindy and her new boyfriend. The so-named boyfriend kept looking back in his side rearview mirror. Uh, hey, Mindy, uh, that pickup is following us. Uh, that's not your dad or, or your brother or uh, some other guy you're seeing, is it? He looked worriedly from one mirror to another. Mindy never bothered to look back. Nah, just keep going. I want her to follow us. The car kept going farther from town, farther from anyone who might help. Anyone who might help, had they known Pam was getting into danger. Had Pam known she was driving into danger and called for help, it was going to be a long wait. The blue and red lights blinking in the rearview mirror of Pam's truck soon got her attention. Uh-oh, now what? I wasn't doing anything wrong. Uh, Pam pulled on, put on her blinker, uh, just like instructor had told her, and then slowed down and pulled to the side of the road. Once she was stopped, uh, she set the parking brake, put on her four-way flashers, and then began to panic as she dug through her purse, looking for her wallet, which held her driver's license. It was hiding down there somewhere, under all the things young girls chose to carry in their purses. In a last desperate maneuver, Pam dumped her purse out on the passenger seat. No wallet. Pam was in a panic. She didn't want to go to jail. Orange was not a good color for her. She was about to start crying, which also wasn't a good look for her, when she spotted her wallet sitting in the console between the seats. As She then remembered placing it there after paying for gas earlier that morning. Whipping out her license and proof of insurance, the green lizard looked concerned that she was about to get a ticket. 
Pam placed both hands on the steering wheel and tried to look as dangerous as a newborn kitten. There was a rap on the window. She removed one hand from the wheel just long enough to press the window roller downer button, and then got her hand up and visible so the officer would not think she was going for a weapon. Bullet holes were also not a good look for her. Miss Bogus, I need you to come with me. We have a situation requiring your talents. His voice sounded awful familiar. Pam turned to see who it was that was sounding as if she should recognize and uh, do things for them. It was Agent Smith, not his real name, from the Department of... He never actually said which government agency he was an agent with. Um, er, uh, Agent Smith, uh, how's everything with the government these days? Pam thought that sounded as dumb as it sounded. We have a situation that requires your unusual talents, and there's no time to argue. Come with me now. This last bit sounded as much like a threat without all the necessity of actually being threatening. Uh, or, or what about my truck? She looked around as if not sure where her truck was. It will be fine right here. Let's go. He was kind enough. Actually, he was nasty enough to open her door and make as if he would drag her out if she didn't come along willingly. Pam jumped out of her pickup. Now, then, when she was halfway to Agent Smith's car, she turned and ran back. And she grabbed her purse and uh, then her cell phone. As she was walking back to Agent Smith's car, she ran back to lock the door. It wasn't just too bad that the window was still rolled down. Once she was in the government car, Agent Smith hit the gas and pulled a U-turn, leaving twin skid marks on the pavement. A Pam hoped those were the only skid marks as she quickly fastened her seatbelt. They sped along at just too much above the posted speed limit. A Pam had to grit her teeth to keep from saying something about it. Agent Smith wasn't in the mood to talk, but then he hadn't been in the mood last time he'd required her services. She sat back and tried to admire the trees as they blurred by the sides of the government sedan. Well, at least if they had an accident, at this rate it would kill Pam and uh, she wouldn't have to suffer too much. Uh, Pam would have recognized the turn as it was coming up if not for the fact that she had her eyes firmly squeezed shut. She didn't want to see the accident that just knew was coming her way. The tires spun on the gravel as Agent Smith made the corner and shot towards the gate. The gate avoided being bent into pretzel by opening up automatically just in the nick of time. Now the agent had to go slower. Any unwarranted rushing vehicle would have been turned into Swiss cheese by the mounted hidden machine guns all along either side of the road. They stopped in front of the same old farmhouse with the same old farmhouse porch. After doing the thing he did to the mailbox by the front door, Agent Smith ushered Pam into the same old not-farmhouse interior. The chocolate chip uniforms were still there, but Pam wondered if they were the same bodies holding them up. Security was just as tight and often as the last time. Pam nearly felt as if she was an old hand at this, seeing as she had been scrutinized by all three of the checkpoints for the second time in less than three months. This time they turned the corner at the end of the corridor and they entered another room. This one was dimly lit and had a huge window looking into a room next door. Pam was pointed to a chair and she was expected to place her body into Okay, so why am I here this time? She was looking around to see if Schrodinger's cat was going to make a second appearance. Agent Smith looked around to be sure nobody had snuck in the room behind them. Uh, we, here at the agency, have come up with a security concern that needs immediate attention. He took a quick look into the room on the other side of the window. 
your name came up as being considered a uh, somewhat trustworthy. Somewhat trustworthy? What does that mean? Pam thought that just maybe this was a personal slight. Agent Smith stared at her. You kept your mouth shut about the last time and we're going to use you again. He stood with his arms crossed as if saying no more questions. The door to the room on the other side of the window opened and a man walked in. He looked around the room before taking a seat in a chair as if directed by some unheard voice. His back was to the window. Pam looked at the man's head and then turned and looked at Agent Smith. He did his best to ignore her inquiring look. After a few minutes, a scientist entered the room. The Mr. Smith chose this time to exit from the room and close the door. Pam knew he was a scientist by the white lab coat he was wearing and the clipboard under his arm. The scientist looked scientifically at Pam. Yes, yes, yes. Um, are you ready? He gave Pam a look that asked her to answer. I'm not sure. Ready for what? She did her best to look too ignorant, to not look too ignorant. Yes, well, the test, of course. He gave Pam another look. The test of the subject. He looked from Pam to the man whose head was visible through the window. The test subject. The scientist quickly flipped through some pages on his pre-required clipboard. He then leapt to his feet and ran to the door, which he opened and looked at the room number. He took a few minutes to compare the room number with the number on his clipboard. Yes, yes, this is the right... He looked at Pam. They did tell you while you're here, right? And not in so many words, she tried to look knowledgeable about something she was totally in the dark about. Yes, uh, see, we need for you to test the subject uh, to see if he is in fact psychic. Yes? Oh, I see. Pam didn't. You want me to run him through the Zenner cards and see how he does? And she felt as if this was not quite what they had in mind, but it was her only guess. Uh, yes, or no, uh, we want you to link with his mind to determine how well he is psychically. He glanced at Pam. Yes? Uh, Pam was growing wary of all these yeses. Uh, no, that's not how psychics work. They, or rather we, don't link with others' minds. We, can re we can't read anyone's mind, uh, sometimes not even our own. Pam saw the look of disbelief come over the scientist's face. I know all about psychics. I've seen the movies. This is very much how it works. He was about to glow a gasket. Do you have any idea how important this procedure is? The security of the nation is at stake here. His face was beginning to turn purple. Pam didn't want to be the cause of anyone having a heart attack. She decided to try a different tact. Uh, look, how about you run him through the Zenner cards and I'll watch. And if I see anything in a psychic manner, I'll let you know. And she gave him her best smile. The little girl smile that never seemed to work on her mom, but did a great job on her dad. The scientist glowered at her a bit. His color was slowing going from purple to red. Red soon turned pink, and after that he was back to the semi-normal coloration. This had better work. He stormed a bit out of the room, trying to slam it as he went. The door-closing device made slamming not a viable thing. Pam sat and waited. After several minutes, another scientist entered the room with the test subject in it. This scientist looked a bit more ladylike, in that she had all the prerequisite lady parts. She sat down across from the subject and pulled a deck of cards from her lab coat. As she shuffled the cards, she worked very hard at not looking at the window through which Pam couldn't be seen because it was a two-way mirror. At last, she held up a card, backside to the subject. 
She looked at the subject, but her eyes kept straying to the mirror, where she must have suspected Pam was sitting. Her gaze was off by a foot. After several minutes of this, Pam began to wonder how the test subject was doing. All she could see was the back of the subject's head and the back of the card. She had no idea what his answers were. Pam gave up and went to see if there was someone around who could either hook up some audio or move her to the room so she could hear and see. After a few hours, the test subject was now facing the window so Pam could see the cards. There was now a microphone sitting in the middle of the table as well. The scientist held up a card and Pam could see it was a parallelogram. Now that's a bunch of wavy lines if you're not familiar with the Zenner cards. The test subject concentrated hard and Pam could see it in his face. Star, he announced with utmost confidence. The next card was a square. Triangle. Once more, he looked as if he had nailed it. The next 23 cards were equally as well read. Uh, Pam had given a clipboard with a sheet of paper to use as a scorecard. Uh, she put a little zero in one of the squares. After the fourth run-through with the cards, Pam added up his score. Let's see, he got zero on the first try, as well as the second. Number three was not much better, and uh, number four came out as a zero as well. The scientist, sitting across from her, looked aghast. You mean he's not psychic at all? Uh, Pam thought about her next statement. Well, you see, it is nearly impossible to score a zero on any test. Anyone not psychic should score at least 20% simply by guessing. His coming in at zero is kind of bizarre. So he is psychic? the female scientist asked. No, he's a non-psychic. He gets a wrong answer, whereas anyone not psychic would have scored 20 at least. The two white-coated people sat close together and began an in-depth discussion. Pam did her best to not listen, but she did listen anyway. If he's not psychic, then how did he score so badly? Uh, she said he's a non-psychic. Well, what the heck is a non-psychic? Well, I sure don't know. Uh, maybe we should ask someone. But who? We don't exactly have experts around here. <laughs> maybe we should call someone. The two both looked across the table at Pam. What is a non-psychic? Uh, just asking. A non-psychic is someone who receives the wrong answer no matter what. To use a non-psychic, you simply ignore any answers and go with the exact opposite of their answer. Pam had read this in a book just last week. The two began another in-depth discussion. After a few more hours of trying to answer their questions, when it was obvious they didn't know what they were doing, Pam was allowed to leave. Mr. Smith came with a handful of forms for her to sign, all the usual non-disclosure, sworn to secrecy, under penalty of prison time, and not a word to anyone. Uh, Pam would have read them, but she was just way too tired, and it was getting close to dinner time, and her mom would not be pleased by another late night. The walk down the corridor was interrupted by the stops at the checkpoints. The elevator ride was the best part. Then more ID looking and computer checking, and then freedom at last. Well, at least the great outdoors. The drive back to where her pickup was parked was uneventful. And a Pam was just glad to be done with this exercise in bizarreness. Stopping behind her pickup, Mr. Smith once more pulled a huge manila envelope from his suit coat and handed it over. Uh, this was her reward for her doing her duty as a good citizen. He was driving away as Pam walked up to the driver's door of her truck. She unlocked the door and jumped in. The window was up and secured. She had already started the engine and was driving away as a nagging question hit her. Uh, didn't I accidentally leave the window down? She looked at the window. Nah. Now Pam got home just in time for dinner. Chapter 14
a sign. Thursday morning found Pam in a less than jubilant mood. She was glad she didn't have to go to school, but the idea of working under Madame Dingus was just too much for her young psyche to endure. She just knew she would become disillusioned and wind up a grumpy old lady if she didn't find some way out from under this card reader. She pulled into the yard parking lot garden and parked. Pulling the book bag from the rear seat, Pam headed in to see what new and miserable ways Miss Dingus, Madame Dingus, would use to torment her. Even though she was officially out of school for a while, as she was still expected to keep up with the rest of the class. Hildy was scrunched down in her seat, only the top of her head visible over the top of her desk. Ah, uh, morning. Is Madame Dingus in? Pam dreaded the coming answer. Nope, ain't seen her yet. Hildy was doing her best to not look happy. The older woman was absent. Pam headed for her office. As she opened the door, she nearly stepped out into a void. The floor was gone. Looking down, Pam could see what had become of her office. The floor had given away under the tremendous weight of all of those police and sheriff and DPS reports. Everything was now laying in a pile twenty feet below. All those file folders had done their best to open their covers and set free the pages contained within. Uh, pages and photographs and notes and lists were now all filed together in one unsurmountable heap. Pam could just make out what remained of her desk, a uh, sticking up at an unnatural angle like a ship sinking below the waves. From the paper promontory, as if it had crashed into the side of a snowy mountain. Her chair sat on top of her desk as well as beside it and a bit under it as well. The chair was scattered hither and yon. There's a saying you don't hear too often, hither and yon. In or too many places, here and there, as in scattered about as if set upon by an angry giant who disliked office furniture. Pam slowly closed the door, and then she swung it open again. Uh, straight across from her, the bookshelves that were built into the wall had survived. The sorted and categorized files that Sharma and Dan had gone to so much trouble to find and put together sat there, nice and neat, as if waiting for her to walk over and take a look. Not until I see about a new floor, or a ladder, Pam closed the door. Pam went to the library coffee shop to upload some caffeine and find a place to sit and consider her options. Eddie scooted a cup of his best across the counter. I told Madam Dingus that was way too much weight in there, but you know how she is. Everyone standing or sitting around them nodded or murmured sounds of agreement. Cassandra tried to put in a happy note. You should move into her old office. Now that she's in the dining room, 2D is empty. Of course, you'll need to move some of her old things out of there, as she kind of just walked out and left everything behind. Pam considered this. The ceiling had been fixed, kind of, and uh, no one walking around in 3D would accidentally wind up laying around in 2D. And it wasn't as if she needed to ask anyone, as she was kind of in charge as long as her uncle was away. Has anybody seen Uncle Ray lately? She suddenly realized she hadn't seen her boss in well over a month. Come to think of it, it had been the last time she'd been hijacked to work for Agent Smith. When Pam was promoted to investigator, Uncle Ray had sent word by phone. Eddie looked up from cleaning the espresso filter holder. He came by yesterday, said hi to everyone, had a cup, and left. Pam was relieved to know her uncle was still sort of running things. It, it took none of the pressure off of her. Hildy stuck her head in the library door. That weirdo giant said to ask you to come up and see her. I think she wants to kill you or something. Uh, thanks. I'll be right up. 
There was no such thing as an intercom. As several had been installed, but everybody got tired of talking to people on the other side of the planet. So uh, Pam had told Grandy to pull the thing. He was using the parts to build an entertainment center for Prince Wapo. Climbing the stairs, Pam found her legs had grown so much stronger over the three and a half months she had worked here. She wasn't even out of breath once at the top of the third floor stair. Hortense was in her room, 3D, still tied to her chair. I think I found something. Look. She pointed between the bars at her mirror. Pam looked over the black silk-clad shoulder, and all she saw was herself. No, 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 try it from over here. Hortense grabbed Pam and drug her sideways to give her a better angle. Pam was now leaning sideways, looking at the wall beside the mirror. See right there, that's Barbara. Pam looked. She tried using her powers of sixth sense. Well, she did see ghosts. Is that? She looked like a vest filled with pockets. Yes, it's Barbara, a ghost hunter's vest. Uh, she must be in it, so that has to be Barbara. Hortense was enjoying, was overjoyed by her discovery. The last time I saw Barbara, she was laying on top of Dolores, so they should be together. I wonder who those other bodies belong to. Uh, Pam was so thrilled by this discovery, she fell to the floor when Hortense let go of her. Getting up on one knee, Pam continued to gaze at the vest, the vest that was hopefully still filled with her missing friend. Do you have any way of figuring out where they are? Pam crossed her fingers on both hands. All I can say for sure is they're both still alive, and I'm fairly sure they're not too far. Too far as in, well, they're both still in this county. Hortense looked at just a bit uncertain. Uh, Pam stared at the vest. Did she just move? It had appeared as if the vest and its inhabitant had moved to the right just a bit. The gears inside her head began to mesh. I have an idea. Uh, grab one of your hand mirrors and let's drive around. Uh, maybe as we get closer the signal will get stronger. Pam ended in a question, and not knowing if this was a good idea or just a lame brain hiccup. Hortense, on the other hand, thought this was a great idea, as she would have jumped to her feet if not for being tied to her chair. If you could give me a hand here, I'll be right with you. As Pam tash dashed past Hildy's desk, she asked, uh, Madam Dingus in yet? She was already halfway out the door, as Hildy said. No, the old bat hasn't come in. Hildy did the least glance. Hildy did at least glance from her magazine, but it was more to scowl at Hortense's back than to answer. Tell her I'll be right back. As Pam ran down the steps of the porch, Hortense was right behind her. They drove out to where Pam had, shang had been shanghaied by Agent Smith. We can start here. Uh, this is where I last sight of Mindy. Pam drove slowly along the side of the road. Hortense held a small hand mirror up in front of her. She gazed into the edges and the corners as the pickup slowly traveled the length of the county road. Wait, back up a bit. Hortense was holding the mirror next to the window. I think I got something there. The vest was just visible in the mirror. Hazy, but there. Pam looked back and forth. She pulled her cell phone out and hit the GPS button. After waiting for the app to get going and telling it she didn't want to buy the latest version or sign up for new shopping app, she found the map she was looking for. There's a road just ahead that will bring us back to just over there. Pam pointed to the passenger window. Let's see what happens. The crossroad was a half a mile ahead. It took them over to an old disused road that led back into the trees. The farther down the road they went, the slower they had to go due to the broken pavement holding up all the potholes. Better, much better. Now Hortense could see all of the pockets with all the incomprehensible gadgets. 
uh, Barbara carried in her quest to capture evidence of ghosts that Pam was able to see and talk to. I'm beginning to see a room followed by a scream. A huge black hand had reached out through the glass and was wrapped around the scryer's head. It was trying to pull her through the looking glass. Pam hit the brakes and tried to help unlatch the black nasty fingers with claws as long as her fingers. A touching this abomination sent a chill through Pam's body. Hortense was slowly losing her battle. Her face was now right up against the glass. Some of her long black hair was already inside the mirror. Her hat was gone. as She had both hands around the handle of the mirror trying to push it away. Pam let go of the fingers and tried grabbing the mirror. There was no way Hortense would fit through such a small opening, but that didn't mean she wouldn't be pulled through anyway. They began to move backwards, not fast, but constant. The further back they went, the less substantial the hand became. Once the pickup was back at the junction where they had turned, the black hand was more of a shadow than an adversary. Hortense was able to pull herself back enough to hurl the hand mirror from the truck. It shattered on the side of the road. Uh Uh-oh, seven years of bad luck, she looked at the now broken glass. Well, you're lucky to still be on this side, so I think the two should cancel each other out. Pam was sitting on the center console, looking out at the broken glass. She didn't trust it to stay broken. That was a smart move. Hortense tried to straighten her hair, some of which was still missing. Uh, I, uh... Pam looked out the window at where they were now parked. I didn't do that. Well, I think. She wondered how she had managed to drive backwards so far without running into a ditch. For those reading not from Texas, country roads usually have a deep dish alongside to channel rainwater away from towns and prevent flooding. Some of these ditches are deep. Well, thank you for saving my life. Hortense turned to the rear view mirror so she could see how much damage had been done to her hairdo. She then immediately pushed the mirror up so that it was pressed against the ceiling. Enough mirrors for today. Pam drove back out to the main road before stopping and taking a deep breath. That was a little too interesting. What do you think? Uh, We were getting closer, what? She looked over at her biggest friend. I could feel that we were getting close, but I could also feel something, something evil was waiting for us. Pam was looking at her GPS. That road dead ends just a few miles farther. Whatever it was, it's got to be at the end of that road. So what do we do now? Hortense was hoping their next move would involve a drive back to the office and a phone call to the National Guard. I could use some coffee and talk with the rest of the bad guys. They headed back to see about making something resembling a game plan. Eddie had pinned a huge map of the county up on the blackboard that he had been wheeled into the library and now sat at the end of the coffee bar. The classroom was filled with ghosts and spirits, all trying to learn how to get in online, and they had priority. Well, it would appear as if the road you were on was not ever placed on this map, or any of the others I've looked at. Eddie was in the process of drawing it in, using a pencil and the descriptions provided by both Pam and Hortense. He was using the eraser far more than the pointy end. Well, it would appear as if the road you were on was never even in, never even put on any maps. No, look, the road curved more than like this. Hortense held up her hand and tried to form her fingers into a windy road. Pam looked on. I thought it was more like a sharp angle, followed by a bendy part. Eddie erased the last line he had drawn and tried again. You said you found the road on your phone GPS. Uh, Let's have a look. 
Pam tromped out to the front porch to see about proving her sharp angle, followed by the bendy part, was more correct than Hortense and her curvy bit. Pam pushed the app for her GPS and then went through the offers, trying to not buy or download anything new. At long last, she had her map. See, we were right. The GPS showed a backtrack of them driving up and down the main road without any of the side road windy curvy bits. Most odd, Eddie went back to the map. We know, we think, that the source of all this activity is somewhere in this general area. He drew a straight line road on the map. The big question is, what do we do about it? Cassandra was hoping to end this adventure with as few casualties as possible. Uh, should we try driving out there and see what happens? Mikey Baba Ganoush wanted to get in on the action, even though he wanted to stay out of this actual action. When he said we, he was actually saying y'all. As everyone sat and wondered what to do next, Prince Wapo came strolling in. He stopped at the leg of the chair being occupied by Bill Palmerhausen. He began to stare up at the man. After a few seconds, Bill got up and moved to a new seat. The prince jumped up onto the now empty cushion. He licked one paw a few times and then got busy sleeping. Mr. Armstrong had brought his action bag up from the office and was checking the explosives as he watched the plan take shape. Why not just storm the castle and see who re uh, surrenders after we shoot up the place? No, we don't want to shoot up the place. Remember, Dolores and Barbara are both in there somewhere. Cassandra was one of the few people who could disagree with Mr. Armstrong and still walk around after. How many kids are missing, and do you think they'll be out there as well? Hortense tried to redraw Eddie's straight line road, but he refused to surrender the pencil. The gathering grew silent as everybody ran out of ideas. Eddie broke the stalemate. So, who wants a lasagna and bacon sandwich? Now, people perked up at the thought of lunch. They had finally come up with a plan, and now it's time to see if it would work without putting too many of them in the hospital or the morgue. Pam drove her pickup back down the same county road where her and Hortense had begun their little adventure. Hortense was once more in the passenger seat, armed with a snow globe and a shotgun, loaded with double-lot buck with holy water and ghost peppers. A George, who was sound asleep in the back seat, had his favorite M16, a several bandoliers filled with two two three rounds, and his coffee cup. Manuel was right behind her, bringing Bruce, Wallace, Cassandra, each had dredged up their weapon of choice. Mr. Armstrong, Eddie, and Bill Palmerhausen had driven out to another road that would run parallel to where Pam was. Uh, they would sneak in by means of the woods and come in from the rear. Pam wanted to go flying in and establish a beachhead before the evil creatures could rally a defense. Turning onto the side road, she was reduced to a crawl due to the road being in such bad shape and arrived at the front of the house 30 minutes behind schedule. In her mind, she was going to dive from the truck, roll across the driveway, and come up locked and loaded. As the door sprung open, she had forgotten to unhook her seatbelt. She kind of just sprawled out and hung from the door. Hortense did manage to jump from the vehicle and run to a convenient tree and take cover behind it. Then she had to lope back to the cab to get the shotgun. She wasn't that good with guns to begin with. Her knee-length dress made a loud swishing sound as she went. George made a, a mumbled statement and began to snore. Where's Manuel? Pam tried to whisper yell. Hortense held up one hand to her ear to show she didn't understand. A man well, Pam tried a bit louder. As the two looked back to the road coming in, the front door swung open. Barbara was standing in the opening, just visible in the dark interior. You ever get that feeling that 
Somebody is staring at you. Pam was getting that feeling, so she turned and looked at the door. Hey, Barbara, come on out. We're here to rescue you, she yelled. She yelled just above a whisper. When that didn't work, she tried moving a little closer to the door to get her attention. Barbara, come on. We're going to get you out of here. The vest pockets were mostly open with things hanging from them like fishing lures for ghosts. Pam looked over at Hortense to see if she had seen Barbara. Hortense was trying to untangle the sling from her shotgun from the hem of her dress. Somehow the two were wrapped up in a huge knot. Pam went as far as the first step to the porch. That's when she saw Dolores was standing right behind Barbara. Guys, come on. We need to get going before the evil thing finds out we're here. Her patients were wearing thin. If you don't come out, I'll come in and drag you out. She thought maybe a little Mr. Armstrong might help. Dolores held out her hand in what looked like a plea for help. This got Pam where it hurt. She ran up the steps and in the doorway. Grabbing one woman in each hand, she was about to propel them out the door when it slammed shut in front of her. Hortense heard the sound of the door slamming shut and looked up. She glanced over to where Pam had been just a second ago. No Pam. Pam, where'd you go? she whispered with a hard edge. As soon as the door was securely closed, the two missing but now found bag members turned on Pam. They each grabbed an arm and began dragging her towards the stairs backwards. Hey guys, wrong way. We need to go that way, Pam tried to point to the door. With both arms behind her, as she could only get her finger pointed in an unrelevant way. The two no longer missing bag members reached the first step and began to climb. Pam was now being drug up the stairs, uh, trying to get her feet working, but it just wasn't working. Hey look, this whole I'm rescuing you all isn't working out right. Let's say we start all over. I'll go back out to my truck and begin all over. What do you say, Pam? Pam's feet went clunk, clunk, clunk as her shoes bounced up each step. Pam tried to pull her arms free, but the women just continued dragging her backwards up the stairs. Hortense looked around the outside of the mansion. She was wondering where Pam had gotten to. She was also wondering what had happened to the rest of the rescue party. Not knowing what to do now that no one was around to sustain the castle storming, she considered leaving. When nothing in the form of an answer came into view, Hortense pulled her cell phone out and scrolled through her contacts. There came the sound of cats fighting, howling and yowling as if two toms had come to blows over the rights to court some young calico. Cassandra grabbed her cell phone out of her enormous bag she was carrying. Manuel gave her a look. Well, I needed some way of recognizing when Hortense called. She hit the answer button. Hortrance tried to whisper loudly. Where are you guys? Cassandra looked out the windshield and then around the sides of the car. We were right behind y'all, but we seem to have lost sight of you. Did y'all continue driving on the main road? Hortense slipped behind Pam's pickup, uh, thinking it might be a safer place to hide. No, we turned off the main road onto that gravelly, beat-up side road. What side road? Cassandra turned to Manuel. We need to go back. They turned back there, somewhere. She pointed back the way they had come. As Manuel turned the car around, Cassandra continued with Hortense. We were right behind y'all, and then you just weren't there anymore. Uh, could you hurry? Pam is kind of not here anymore, and things are not going as planned. Hortense looked into the cab to be sure that George was still with her. He was curled up on the back seat, his rifle tucked under his arm like a teddy bear. Uh, can you check with Mr. Armstrong and see where they are, too? Hortense hooked up and looked around for any attacking monsters that she may have missed. Mr. Armstrong was marching through the trees as if in pursuit of his next meal. 
He kept his rifle, a fully automatic M4 with a tack light, laser sight, and a 100-round drum magazine at ready rifle. A vibration came to him from a pocket of his suit coat. Holding up one hand, he stopped his team. His team had to hurry to catch up so they could stop close enough to be considered a part of his team. Taking a knee, Mr. Armstrong pulled his phone out without taking his eyes off the sights. What? he said in a voice just short of a threat. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, this is Cassandra. Hortense just called to inquire as to your approximate arrival at the rescue scene. Mr. Armstrong looked around at his perimeter. He then sniffed the air. He went one finger with his lips and held it in the air. The wind was out of the south. We've been walking way too long and seem to have missed our target location. He nearly felt as if he had screwed up somehow. We backtracked and we circled around, but the target objective has eluded us. Cassandra looked at Manuel. They're lost. She quickly put her finger over the phone mic. Uh, she could just make out Mr. Armstrong's voice yelling. We're not lost. We're just not where we should be. Manuel looked at the side road. The side of the road. They must have turned off the main road somewhere along here, but where? He was driving slowly along the shoulder, scanning the trees for any openings. Pam tried looking over her shoulder to see where she was going. She could see Barbara's ghost hunting vest with all of its cool guy gear, most of which was hanging from their lanyards, swinging back and forth as they ascended the stairs. Pam tried to look over the other shoulder, but all she could see was the back of a flak vest. On uh, Mr. Armstrong, it would have looked all right, but on Dolores, it was huge. Wait a second. The two women stopped dragging Pam and looked around at her. I think I left my coffee cup in the truck. Uh, Pam was running out of ideas. The drag up the stairs continued. Once at the top, the pair turned and began walking down a long hallway. It was lined on both sides by doors, all of which were closed. They came to the one and only door which stood open and drugged their prisoner through. Pam only became aware the door was open as she passed through the portal. The walls on each side looked as if they could use a good scrubbing and a few coats of paint. Pam was about to ask where her new location was when she spotted Mindy laying in the corner a crumpled mess. As she was about to ask about the teen laying in the corner when Dolores and Barbara spun her about to face the other side of the room. Pam's questions got stuck in her throat. A sitting in a chair, which was behind a desk, sat what looked like a human shape. It was black, a total black, like the absence of everything in the center, but faded to gray as her eyes moved from the middle. Towards the edges, the shape was just faded gray. A cold, sharp edge radiated out from this being. As Pam stood and stared at this unknown entity, her two escorts both collapsed to the floor, joining Mindy as untidy floor decorations. Pam was about to look over at her friends, but noticed as they slipped away, the entity grew more human-shaped. It now looked like a person who had lived way past his time on Earth. His skin wasn't so much wrinkled as desiccated. Uh, maybe a gallon of moisturizer should be suggested. Uh, er, howdy? Pam thought this was the best way to begin. The thing behind the desk only stared at her. The expression on its face showed neither surprise nor anger. Pam considered her options. As she could question this strange-looking creature and gain some information to help her defeat it, if defeating was what needed doing, or she turned and ran out the door. She who turns and runs away lives. The doors all along the hallway were flung open. This brought Pam to an abrupt halt. As she stood there wondering if she might have a third option, the doors all filled with people. Young people. 
people who looked as if they belonged in school if school were filled with semi-zombies. They didn't look like zombies, but more like kids trying to look like zombies, but without all the makeup and special effects. They looked dried out, and worse for wear, but they just didn't look like zombies. Pre-zombies? They all needed a bath, or rather a bunch of baths. Unwashed body funk filled the air. The hallway in both directions was filled with the cast from a high school zombie production. Pam felt a bit out of place being the only one wearing clean clothes and deodorant and minus the vacant look. She stepped backwards into the room she had just escaped from. Now there's something you don't see. The entity behind the desk had just turned from blackness surrounded by mist. As she watched it form into a man once more, this got her to thinking. Did you just spend a lot of your energy to animate all those kids in the hallway? She looked out the door at what now looked like a battle scene. Why should I tell you anything? As he spoke, the entity grew closer to a man than a shadow. Well, it's the decent thing to do, so I'll know what's going on. Other words, I'm kind of in the dark here. Pam was hoping this creature would give her a clue as to what was going on and maybe come up with a plan to win this ordeal. Had this been a movie, now would have been the time for the villain to explain his plan for global conquest uh, so the audience would have a clear understanding of the plot. This is not a movie. Her question was answered by an evil chuckle. Hortense was at a loss as to what to do. She wanted to make a run for it, but felt this was not the most heroic course of action. As she was not a coward, but with no idea how to proceed, she felt as if being a coward just might not be all that bad of an idea. Thinking about the time Pam had saved her life by nearly drowning her to save her life from the land of the Bigfoot helped steer her decision-making. Whatever I do, I'll have to live with my actions, and hopefully for a long time. Hortense did her best to sneak across the lawn. Well, what would have been a lawn had anybody had bothered to pull the weeds and water the green stuff? She held the shotgun in what she hoped was a threatening and correct manner. The shotgun was on loan from Mr. Armstrong's collection. When he found out Hortense was far from skilled with firearms, he had handed her the shotgun. He immediately snatched it away from her when she had put her finger on the trigger. A short, quick lecture on which end did the work and how to not kill any of her fellow rescuers, uh, then the shotgun was handed over once more. With both hands tied up holding the weapon, she was forced to carry her snow globe, crystal ball, in a shoulder bag. She would have felt less cumbersome holding the globe and not the armament. She scuttled along, crouched over as if nobody could have spotted a six-foot-eight woman dressed in black satin with an umbrella shoved through her belt like a sword. The only reason nobody spotted her was everybody inside was busy holding down the floor. Once Hortense was near the wall of the building, she crept along the wooden plank siding of the wall, looking for a way in. She worked her way along the wall, but saw no doors, allowing access to the interior. There were plenty of windows, but they were all just a bit high up off the ground, like above five feet. When no easy access was found, Hortense opted for one of the windows. She tried to open it, but of course the thing was locked. Through the glass, she could see what must be a kitchen. Either that or these folks had a stove in their living room. Looking down, she spotted a nice inviting rock by her boot. This will have to do. She hefted the rock and then looked at the window. She looked both ways to see if anybody was watching. She hesitated. Breaking someone's window was just not what she did. It felt wrong in so many ways. She considered her options. 
Either I break this window and get inside and save Pam, or I stand here and hope somebody comes along and does it for me. She closed her eyes and swung the rock. The sound of shattering glass filled the air. Hortense looked around to see if anybody had snuck up on her while she was doing this dirty deed. Nobody had appeared. She then looked at the window. It was very much not broken. The rock was laying on the floor on the other side of the unbroken window. What in the world is going on here? She looked around for another rock. Hortense looked through the window at the pile of rocks now littering the floor of the kitchen. The unbroken glass still a barrier to her entrance. Looking about the ground, she was out of rocks. I'm getting in on the other side of this wall. If it's the last thing, she considered this, I'm getting in no matter what. Hefting the shotgun, she slammed the butt end into the glass. She flinched, but she managed to keep her eyes open. As the stock crashed through the window, there was a nice big hole. As she pulled the shotgun back out the newly formed hole, it simply closed back up by, well, magic. Oh, now this is just plain stupid. She hit the glass once more. Once more a nice hole opened up, only to close once the shotgun was extracted. She was growing frustrated. She punched through the window. This time she left the stock resting on the now shattered window frame. The f hole failed to close. Okay. Hortense grasped the shotgun in one hand and leaned her weight against the wall. The opening was about chest level. She tried to jump up onto the windowsill. And this did much to drain her energy as it did little to gain her entry. Frustration turned to anger. She managed to get one arm up over the sill, thus suspending her by one arm from the broken window. This hurt a lot. Her armpit was being rubbed raw by all her jumping and wiggling. Trying to take the pressure off her armpit, she got the other arm up and pulled. Her boots weren't designed to climb walls, and the soles slid along the smooth wooden siding. One toe did find purchase as it hooked on a small gap in the boards. Up and over her upper body, her feet doing their best to propel her upwards and inwards. Now she hung there, her lower anatomy still hanging down the outside of the wall. She had to catch her breath before she could do any more work at gaining entrance. I need a vacation, somewhere nice and quiet, like maybe an enchanted rock. She wiggled her body, slowly getting her... Why do I always have cats running? Oh, I know, because I have lots of cats. <laughs> mm. She wiggled her body, slowly getting her knee up onto the sill. Now gravity had changed its task. From keeping her on the other side of the wall, it propelled her into the rock-strewn kitchen as she landed with a crash. Pam heard sound, what sounded like glass breaking. Uh, then she heard more glass breaking. As the clock ticked away the afternoon, she decided someone was out breaking every window on the ground floor. The evil entity seemed uninterested in this turn of events. When what sounded like a body being dropped from a great height, Pam saw the entity waver slightly. It faded just a bit. Are you here for the party? Hortense looked up from her position on the floor. A young kid stood in the doorway to the kitchen. His hair was slicked black with grease. He was dressed in a black leather jacket with what had been a white t-shirt. Now it was more brown and gray. His blue jeans were rolled up at the cuffs. There was a toothpick sticking from his mouth. You're quite a doll. How about a dance? The young man leered at Hortense. Hortense's tastes in men ran towards tall and well-dressed. A suit and a tie were in order. Opening doors and offering a hand up were what she liked. This kid was far from her dream date. 
Getting one knee under her, her head was now level with his. The shotgun just kind of came up, pointed right at his chest. Your loss, he turned and began to leave. As his leg passed out from under the kitchen, he froze. Something was holding him in place. His head came around and his vacant eyes pointed at Hortense's direction. Not party, death. The young man turned and started her way. Hortense raised the shotgun and would have blown the kid away had not the safety been on. She pulled the trigger harder. As the greaser got within arm's reach, she whacked him on the ear with the barrel. He folded like a cheap lawn chair, and now the other cat's trying it. Man! <laughs> hmm, okay. Uh, sorry, I didn't want to do that, she looked at the unconscious boy. And next time, try threatening somebody who cares. And she moved over to the opening to the next room. The next room looked to be a dining room. All the chairs, and there were a lot of them, held the bodies of what looked like high school kids, all waiting for their turn at the bathroom. The smell of unwashed bodies caused Hortense to gasp. With eyes watering, she quickly crossed the room to the next room. Pam watched as the evil entity, there was just no other way to describe him, sat and shimmered from nearly solid to slightly translucent. Pam took the opportunity to move to the side of the desk. She wanted to get to the window and make good her escape, provided the window wasn't too high up off the ground. As she was about to pass, the entity grew solid once more. It's no good you're trying to escape, Pamela Bogus. You will remain here for all of eternity. The sound of bodies moving in the hallway was soon followed by the sound of bodies now in the room. Why does he know your name? You didn't ever tell him, did you? Uh, tell me you didn't tell him. Pam was about to try her luck and run for the window when something stuck in her mind. Wait a minute. How do you know my name? She stood and stared at the man behind the desk. I've known about you since the day you were born. I've been waiting for you to grow strong enough and near enough to claim you as my prize. He chuckled maniacally. I would have used your grandfather, but he was too smart for me. Not like you. Run away! The Pam thought about the last statement. Wait a minute. Are you saying I'm not very smart? And then she considered the fact that she was standing here arguing with an evil entity instead of running for her life. Questions fought each other in her mind, trying to reach her tongue. All those accidents in home ec, uh, did you have anything to do with them? The evil entity, now looked very much like an evil old man, chuckled. Well, of course I needed to get you away from that school so I could guide you to me. And all those kids inviting me to parties? Uh, Pam now figured she wasn't becoming as popular as she had thought. Yes, it was to draw you into my trap. Hortense picked her way through the room, after the, the next room. They were all filled with the bodies of young kids who, although they looked dead and smelled close to being dead, uh, there were minute signs of life. A movement here, a groan there. Somebody was snoring in one corner. Once or twice, Hortense stepped on one or two outstretched hands, eliciting a slight yell of pain and anger, but the source of such outbursts immediately fell back into whatever kind of a state was involved as soon as her weight was removed. There was a staircase leading up. She looked up at the landing, contemplating the wisdom of wandering farther into this house of the weird, if there was a basement, then there should be a stairs going down as well. Maybe the basement is a better place to look. Hortense began looking for the entrance to the underground portion of this mansion. Pam was so engrossed in what she had just heard, the idea of slipping out the window and seeking the safety of the yard had vanished from her mind. Um, you've been doing what to where? The evil entity grew as close to a whole person as Pam had seen so far. 
I will take your soul and make it my own. Whoa, wait a minute. I'm kind of still using it. How about we think about this some more and silence. His voice shook the room, causing dust and bits of plaster to fall from the ceiling. I have waited long enough. Now I will feed. He stood up, not like he used his legs to raise from behind the desk, but as if he levitated up and moved closer to her. Pam wanted to run. Every ounce of her being wanted to run. She willed her body to make a break for it. She moved and not a bit. A new voice joined the already crowded inside of her head. You don't want to go anywhere. Just stay and enjoy the party. Pam felt as if this new voice was right. It was soothing and it made her feel as if she belonged here. Party. Pam said, not wanting to do anything but enjoy herself. Hortense hit the top of the steps and tripped over the sprawling form of some kid dressed as if attending a costumed party. She glanced down just long enough to see he wasn't about to grab her foot and then ran for the only door that was closed. Anyone yelling like that would want the door shut, she reasoned. Cat. I don't know why they all choose to run back and forth in front of the camera when I'm trying to do the, the story, but they do. That's cats. The door was good and solid. It was built by somebody way back when doors were built to show the world how a massive hunk of wood could be both artistic and functional at the same time. This door could be used to stop an army, either in or out, depending on which side they started on. The latch, well, it was designed to hold the door shut. It was never intended to stop or even slow down a giant intent on reaching her best friend. Hortense hit the door with her shoulder, and the door did its best to get out of her way. It slammed back against the wall so hard the momentum caused it to bounce off the wall and swing shut once more. A good kick got the offending egress out of her way. The sight was nearly too much to take. Pam was standing in the center of the room. She looked as if she were having the best time of her life. There was what looked like a black cloud of insects buzzing around her, as if looking for a place to build their nest. Hortense reached out, grabbed Pam by the arm, and pulled. She came free from the black swarm with a sound of a cork being removed from a bottle. Are you okay? Can you hear me? Say something. Pam just slumped to the floor. The black swarm of nastiness swarmed into a man. A very old man. A very old and upset man. He looked downright miffed. As if Hortense had just stolen his dessert. Stop right there. More plaster rained down from above. You're not the boss of me. Hortense yelled, but she wasn't too sure why. Uh, grabbing the now unconscious form at her feet, she slung Pam over one shoulder, and then she turned and bolted for the door. The door swung shut right in front of her. It was intent on stopping her exit. The latch was in no shape to stop anyone, and Hortense yanked the door open and ran into the hall. As she turned for the stairs going down, all the semi-dead floor dwellers came to life. They rose up and began to move towards the two escapees as if intent on removing what life force they had. Hortense turned and ran for the far end of the hall. As she went, more kids poured from doors on either side of the passageway. Hortense reached the end of the hall looking for an escape route. There was a window that looked out on the yard below. The jump wouldn't kill her, but it might break an ankle or two. One door was still closed to her right. Any closed door had a 50-50 chance of leading somewhere not here. She flung the door open and ran through, only looking at her new surroundings once she was well surrounded by them. A tiny, dusty, old, unused stair led up. Now, this is not what I was looking for. She tried to reason with the staircase. Uh, couldn't you have gone down instead? This would have been a much more convenient. 
The stairs just sat there, uh, still in an upward position. Well, it's up then. She bore her load up to the next level. Mr. Armstrong led his team back and forth, only to find himself, as well as them, in an empty clearing. Any idea as to where we are? Eddie looked around, but could see nothing that even kind of sort of looked like an outhouse, let alone an evil command center. We've worked our way back and forth as far as each of the roads surrounding this place. There's just nothing here. Mr. Armstrong was out of ideas. We'll wait here and see what develops. He was not a patient man, but he also didn't like wasting time and energy without any form of production. Manuel had stopped his car and was examining the trees on the side of the road. It looks like these trees don't match all the others along here. He was pointing to a wall of maples set in the middle of nothing but pines. But there's no road here, he tried peering into the trees. Nothing. Hortense dropped Pam on the floor, her head crashing to the rest of her body. As she had planned to gently set her down in a friendly sort of way, but after breaking into this house, searching the downstairs, and then storming the second floor and running up the hall and up the stairs, she was a bit spent. Her gentle set turned into more of a hard drop. We're safe for now. There came a pounding on the door below. Sort of. She looked around for possible escape route. They were in an attic. Boxes and old furniture was piled everywhere. Dust and cobwebs ruled every surface. At the far end, she could see the glow of a window. Things, large, heavy things, were piled between her and it. Pam sat up. Oh, my head! She felt a bump on the top. She looked over at her tall friend. What happened? Where are we? Looking around, she decided they were in some kind of an attic. The pounding at the door grew serious. Hortense made a decision. Reaching down, she grabbed a box and shoved it out of her way. She pushed a chair over, sending it down into the stairwell. She pulled the next box over to get a clear path to the rest of the obstacles. The box tore open, spilling old books out onto the floor. Hortense kicked the books away, causing several to open, exposing their inner sleeves. Pam, feeling just a bit lost, pulled one of the books over and looked at the page. It's an old yearbook. Look, it's from my school. She held up the book so Hortense could see. Oh, really? What year? Hortense stopped what she was doing to share in the discovery. It says in 1990. She thumbs a few pages. Look, here's a picture of Mr. Hammerhead. He looks so young. I had no idea the principal was ever young. Her head was still trying to get going. And there goes the cat again. <laughs> I'm not going to get to the end of this book if this keeps up. Hortense threw more furniture down the stairwell, then had a seat next to Pam. She needed a break, and this was just about the only break she could think of. She pointed to the page. Isn't that your dad? But who's the young girl he's with? Pam looked at the photo. It showed her dad, a very young version of her dad. He was a senior, and he was being way too friendly with a young woman. The title said, Albert Bogus with Pamela Fack at the prom. Pam felt kind of icky. Here was her father cavorting with some girl about her age. Oh, this is horrible. I had no idea he ran around with other women before Mom. Hortense looked at the photo and then at Pam. What's your mom's maiden name? Pack? Pam looked at the photo closer. The hair was a different color, but once she added a few years and a hair coloration, it was her mom looking back at her from the yearbook. Oops. Feeling just a bit stupid, Pam flipped the page. Look at the chemistry class. Why are they all dressed like that? The page showed a bunch of kids all dressed in robes. Pam read the heading. Oh, it says the chemistry and alchemy class. She looked at the faces of the class. 
No one was recognizable. I wonder what they're doing. She looked at the next page. <laughs> the next photo showed an older man, dressed like the others, only with far more fancy decorations on his robe. He must be the teacher. She looked at the photo. The man looked somehow familiar. He looked to be about 60 or 80, but uh, still she felt as if she knew him. Wait a minute, it's him, the evil entity. He was a teacher. Hortense read the description. It says his name was Mr. Thresher. He ran the chemistry alchemy class. Here they are trying to turn gold into lead. Somehow this sounded wrong. The pounding at the attic door had stopped. It was quiet. Too quiet. A something rotten was about to happen. The floor began to shake. There was a loud creaking sound as if boards were being pulled from their neighbors. A rafter snapped, followed by a second. Daylight flooded into the dusty attic. Pam and Hortense jumped to their feet, intent on running, but there was no place to run to. So they moved from one foot to the other, unable to stand still. The floor of the attic began to come apart, pushed from below by some unstoppable force. As Pam watched, the head of the evil entity came up from below. We should get going, Hortense looked down at the stairwell. Maybe I shouldn't have thrown so many chairs down there. Now the evil entity's head and shoulders were pushing up past the roof. Shingles were raining down onto Pam and Hortense. They threw their hands up to protect themselves. As the evil entity continued to grow, the floor of the attic began to fall apart. Boards and boxes fell down into the void below. An old, well-stuffed chair went sliding along and plowed into the side of the evil entity. A hand reached up and crushed it to kindling. Pam saw a hole where the huge dresser had been sitting. Come, she grabbed Hortense's hand and dove for the opening. Hortense had about twice the mass of Pam, but Pam was using the forces of sheer terror combined with momentum to drag the scryer along and into the shaking hole. They plunged down into the floor below. Pam landed on some kids' stomachs and kind of bounced off of them. Hortense came on top of several girls all laid on the floor, and they yelled and jumped but then settled back down into their stupor. The two could see the waistline of the evil entity now known as Mr. Thresher. His legs had pushed down through the floor to the first level. The blackness seemed to try to draw them into it. Pam looked at Hortense. They used the shotgun, quick. I kind of left it in the attic. As Hortense said this, Pam saw the shotgun go flying by down into the basement. This looks like the perfect time to run. They both had the same idea at the same time, so they ran. The staircase leading down to the front door was getting closer as the house began to come apart. The stairs were shaking so bad they had to hold on to each other as well as the banister. Pam remembered a trip to a carnival one time. She had stepped into what was misnamed as the fun house. The stairs shook just like the fun house had. She hoped she wasn't going to be sick again. Reaching the bottom at last, they found the front door was no longer there. In its place was a hole. The entire wall had fallen over. Out onto the porch and down to the yard, now the clean, clear air of felt safe. As safe as you can get when there was a 50-foot-tall evil entity trying to make a snack out of you. Mr. Thresher had stopped growing. Now he was crashing his way through what was left of the old mansion. Did you hear something? Eddie looked around the clearing. Kind of like wood being torn apart. Yeah, but I don't know where it came from. Mr. Armstrong was looking around, trying to find the source of the splintering wood. The yard was scattered with bodies. All the unconscious teens had been ejected from their resting places to find new accommodations to hold down. The bodies had fanned out, forming a kind of a circle, a circle of unwashed teens. Pam was about to make a run for the trees when the bodies came to life. Oh, shoot. 
As she watched, the teens all came to their feet to form a wall of physiques. Shoulder to shoulder, they began to walk towards our two intrepid investigators. Pam watched as the ring of semi-dead teenagers began to move in her direction. It was also Hortense's direction, but Pam didn't think she needed to point that out. Hortense watched as the teens began to come closer. A whisper came to her ear. Look at Mr. Thresher. He's shrinking. Pam was positioned to see what was left of the old house, as well as the less than substantial evil entity, now standing in a pile of shattered boards. I think as he uses his energy to move his followers, he loses power. Hortense took a quick look over her shoulder. There's only so much of him to go around. She turned back to the approaching wall of stinky teens. So what do we do now? Pam had no idea. I don't. Quick, follow me. She ran towards what looked like the thinnest mass of beings. Hortense turned and followed, unsure as to why, but lacking anything else to do, so she followed. Pam had somehow hung on to the yearbook. As she got close to the wall of bodies, she threw it at the heads of several kids. They all ducked, more out of habit than fear. As they ducked to avoid being clocked by this large, heavy tome, a Pam shouldered her way through, followed closely by her giant companion. Clearing the wall of bodies, Pam took to her heels to reach the tree line. Just before she reached the trees, she turned and began running along the edge. Hortense considered this a dumb thing to do, but she stuck close behind anyway. Get them! Bring them to me! Now! Mr. Thresher screamed. The wall of unwashed beings began to chase the two escapees. A being of one mind, they all fell in line behind the two and tried to catch them. Mr. Thresher could only energize their bodies. He couldn't make them think. Pam looked back. When she saw the parade following them, she made sure to not run too fast as to lap anyone. Uh, they were now running in a huge circle around the perimeter of what had been an old building. Hortense could feel a burning pain in her side. It wasn't as if she was in bad shape, it was that she wasn't all that into running, especially not in a knee-length dress and boots. I can't make it. Go on without me. Pam reached back and grabbed a handful of black satin. Uh, come on, just a bit farther. But we're running in a circle. I know, but look. Pam aimed one finger at the pile of wood formerly called a house. Mr. Thresher was swaying back and forth. His eyes had a faraway glazed look. Just a bit farther, Pam got hold of Hortense and began pushing her along. One of the kids chasing them fell to the ground, then a second, followed by six more. The pack was falling apart. Pam drew to a halt. Hortense chose that moment to collapse to the ground. I think I'm going to... Only one student still coming at her. Pam watched as Mindy came staggering up on her high heels, as she looked uh, far worse for the wear. She stopped in front of Pam, placed one hand on her shoulder, and fell over. Mr. Thresher stumbled around the pile of wood. He looked as if he was half his original size. His human size, not his evil entity, bolstered up by energy pulled from his followers' size. Mr. Armstrong leaped to his feet, bringing his rifle up to his shoulder. Freeze right there, you scumbag teenage kidnapper, you, he yelled without bothering to leave space between the words. When he was right in front of Mr. Thresher, he grabbed the diminutive evil man and was about to slap handcuffs on him. Mr. Thresher crumbled into dust and blew away. Eddie and Bill came walking over to examine what was left of the house. Hey, look, it's Barbara and Dolores. Eddie began moving boards to free the two women. As he dug, he found Madame Dingus. 
followed by a fourth body. There's someone else here, too. Uh, just then, Manuel came driving into the clearing, just in time to watch Mr. Thresher being blown away. Bruce Wallace jumped from the rear seat, well, sort of, and walked over to see if he could at least give words of encouragement as Bill and Eddie dug through the wreckage. That looks like Naomi Cuthbert. He leaned on his cane and watched as more of the four women came into view. Barbara was the first to come around. Pam, I told you to swing me around and through the mirror. She looked around at the devastation she was a part of. Dolores just sat there holding her head, trying to get the world to stop spinning. Madame Dingus just sat staring at her surrounding. Naomi Cuthbert sat up, looked around, and then passed out. Pam nudged Bindi in the arm. As the teen began to wake, she got down to business. What's going on, and who are all these people? There were about 150 kids beginning to stir and move around as if lost. Mindy looked around at the mess. Feeling as if she might be blamed for some of this, she immediately tried for the victim card. It's not my fault. I was duped. She said she would have fun, enjoy ourselves, but when the party got going, it was just a bunch of people I didn't know, and I felt sick and then drained, and that man was using us to feed himself to live forever. The police came rolling to a stop nearby. The officer took one look at who was there. Seeing Mr. Armstrong, he drove away. Chapter 15 The End at Last they loaded Madame Dingus, Dolores, and a very confused Naomi into the back seat of Manuel's car, and he drove back to the office. Things needed to be sorted out, and quick. A Barbara went in to Pam's pickup right next to the still-sleeping form of George to be driven to the school for more investigations. Mr. Armstrong had called in several favors and got three buses to haul the kids over to the school gymnasium, where a briefing and interrogation and maybe a bit of a slapping was to take place. After several hours of frustration squeezed in between disbelief, lots of screaming, a few tears and some mean looks, they got things sorted out. Kind of. It turned out they had ten kids, all from the fifties, who had spent most time in the mansion, but had the absolute least knowledge as to what had happened. It looked as if the longer they were in the company of Mr. Thresher, the less they could recall. There were about fifteen kids from the seventies, but they were all into peace and love and had little to add to the situation. The kids from the 90s were more informative and told about how they had been tricked into joining Mr. Thresher and trying to form a power cult. They were trying to gain enough power to take over the school and thus bring their grades up. Several of them were convinced that Pam was actually Paula, as she did kind of look like a younger version of her mom. Then there were Pam's classmates. They were mostly in bad mood, which grew even worse once their folks arrived to claim them. It became apparent that Mr. Thresher had begun his nefarious activities back in the 50s. The kids had been picked for their willingness to do anything so long as it was against the rules. He had used the missing kids to maintain his station in life and just kept showing up at school for the next 50 years. With the steady turn over in staff and the kids only hanging around for four to eight years, nobody noticed that he wasn't aging. Around the end of the 90s, right about the same time schools began to develop databases, Mr. Thresher decided he should make good his retirement. He began sending out one or two of his followers to obtain fresh bodies any time he needed a recharge. As for Pam, Mr. Thresher had tried to do battle with her grandfather long before that exorcism went astray. He knew Pam would be a fantastic source of energy once she was old enough to use. He was as patient as he was bent. Pam looked around at all these kids and wondered why they would, or what they were going to do with them. All of them were for the bottom of their class. 
She went to talk with Cassandra. Now what? We need to do something with them. We can't just turn them loose on the city. Cassandra had been busy listing the names of the last known addresses of the collected mass. First, we'll get them all a good scrubbing and some new clothes. Then we'll see about getting them back into school. Some of these kids have a D average. That just isn't right. There are only so many basements for them to live in, she looked at Pam. You really don't have to worry. Uh, let Mr. Hammerhead worry about it. It's not really his job, but we don't need to tell him that. Once Barbara was most of the way back to normal, she used her skills of persuasion to find answers to some of her questions. Who did locker number 667 belong to? The school had chosen to skip one number, so 667 was actually 66. So 667 was actually right next to 665. Do the math. One of the girls finally held up her hand. And why was Pam Bogus' homework in your locker? The girl looked around to be sure no one else was there to answer. I borrowed it. She couldn't quite look Barbara's direction. Is that anything like stealing? Maybe, kind of, sort of. The girl had forgotten she was supposed to be tough. And the necklace? I found it. Found it where? In a house? The girl could hold out no more. Okay, I borrowed it from my grandmother. I was going to take it back, but then I forgot. She just wanted this old woman to stop looking at her. Uh, Barbara was all of 28 years old. Uh, Barbara was so relieved that Pam had nothing to do with the suspicious jewelry, she didn't bother to find out any more about the illegally acquired neckwear. If you noticed that Sandy, Sarah's sister, her real sister, had vanished Sunday night or maybe Monday morning, well, she didn't get kidnapped by Mr. Thresher or any of his minions. Uh, she had gone to the party as planned, but then she received a phone call from her father, the one who bought her the fancy pants car she was driving, the Jaguar. So she decided she would much rather go live with him and his new wife. Uh, she was considerate enough to call her mom and let her know, but Miss Bellum had neglected to inform anyone as to the whereabouts of her eldest daughter. It took not long at all before Sandy began to regret her decision. Her new stepmother was everything you would expect from a fairy tale. Uh, she'll be back in time for the next breathtaking bag adventure. As far as all the teachers who had called in sick, they were simply sick of trying to teach a class that was mostly missing. Mrs. Sandtiger was suffering from too much smoke inhalation. The best thing to come from all of this was, with so many new kids with such low test scores, it caused Pam to go from a strong C to a B+. Plus. I hope you enjoyed this story. Uh, if you did, tell your friends that they should listen as well. And don't worry, I will be continuing with the bag stories as soon as I get to the next book, which will be... I have no idea what the next one is. Anyway, until next uh, story, this is Chris James for Storytime. Are you, are you coming to the tree With a strong upper man, the same murder three Strange things that I've been hearing, a stranger would it be If we met at midnight in the hanging tree